Welcome to Adorama, and my name is Stan Honda. I'm a, a professional photographer. Uh, for 34 years, I, did a, I was a full-time photojournalist. Today, I'll be talking about uh, night sky photography, uh, photographing what I call night sky landscapes. I'll go over uh, some of the pictures that I've taken over the, f the last few years and uh, talk about a few, few techniques. Um, there'll be three parts to the, uh, to the workshop today. I'll, I'll uh, show a slideshow of pictures and then I'll do a little tutorial about the camera controls. Um, if you brought your camera, then be, be a good time to take that out, and that'll be in about an hour. And then I'll, uh, I'll do a little uh, tutorial about working in Photoshop, processing the pictures a after you take them. Uh, like I said, I was a photojournalist for uh, 34 years, and uh, I, I still do part-time photojournalism. Uh, that just means that I, I take a lot of pictures that you see in newspapers, on websites, and magazines uh, of, of news events, and that, that's kind of a broad, uh, broad topic. It, I covered a lot of news and sports, uh, business stories, politics, uh, a lot of human interest features. I worked on newspapers in San Diego uh, and in New York City. I grew up in San Diego, so that's where I started my, my career. Uh, I actually worked for the uh, campus newspaper at the University of California, the San Diego campus. That's where I went to school. Learned a lot on the, on the job there. We didn't have a, a formal journalism or photojournalism program, so I, I learned quite a bit there. And uh, I ended up in New York in 1989. My wife and I moved out here uh, when I got a job with uh, New York Newsday, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a, a New York City edition of, uh, of Newsday. And after that, I uh, did a lot of freelance work, and in 2003, I was hired by Agency France Press, which is the the French version of the, uh, if you know the Associated Press, the AP here in the United States, it's an international wire service like the AP, and uh, AFP had bureaus and offices all over the world. The, the main headquarters for North America is in Washington, D.C., and I was part of the New York City Bureau where we had three photographers and a group of reporters um, reporting on the news from here and generally the eastern part of the country. and. I, it was, there was some traveling involved, which was great. I got to travel to different countries and, and see different things. Um, so I'll go over a few of the, uh, just a few of the pictures that I shot over the years with, with AFP. Politics was a big subject for AFP since they're uh, the headquarters for, at least for the U.S., is in Washington, D.C., so the, the uh, coverage of the nation's capital was a big, uh, a big topic for AFP. Uh, in, um, in 2008, to, uh, actually started in 2007. I was lucky enough to be covering some of the um, presidential campaigns during the leading up to the 2008 election. And in 2009, I, uh, went, I joined the, uh, or the group of photographers in Washington with AFP to cover the, uh, the inauguration of Barack Obama. And uh, the, the angle that I got, the angle that I was uh, assigned to was on the east side of the U.S. Capitol, uh, which is actually behind the podium of, of where the, uh, the president was being sworn in down here. Uh, most people liked the, liked the head on view. They, they could see people's faces and they could see a, have a direct view of the action. This one, uh, it turned out to be, uh, to me, a, a really great angle and I think a real storytelling angle where the, we were, were able to see the actual swearing in and the member, members of Congress down here and some dignitaries, but we were also able to see this uh, uh, in, in, incredible array of people going uh, along in front of the Capitol, out on the, the mall, all the way to the Washington Monument. So uh, I think there were several million people in Washington, D.C. that day to watch this historic event. And uh, the angle that, that myself and a few other photographers had, I think, uh, to me, was one, one, one of the best. In, uh, in 2003 and uh, 2004, uh, I was sent to uh, Iraq to cover the, the post-war period. And uh, it, uh, we did a lot of reporting from, uh, I was based in, in the Baghdad Bureau that they had set up there and did a lot of reporting from there and from different, different cities uh, in Iraq. In 2004, I joined up with a, uh, a unit in uh, Tikrit, one of the northern cities. Uh, they were preparing to head back to their home base in Fort Hood, Texas. So uh, for, for five weeks, I, uh, I lived with them and traveled with them on their way through uh, Kuwait and then eventually back to, uh, t to Texas. In, uh, in 2010, there was a devastating earthquake in Haiti, 
And uh, so about a, I was on another assignment, but about a week after the, the earthquake, uh, they sent me down to join the Bureau there. Uh, and so there were lots of photographers from different, different parts of the world there for, uh, from AFP, so I was able to meet um, the, uh, there. As well as in uh, places like Iraq, you get to meet uh, a lot of the AFP photographers from, from the different countries, from different backgrounds. So uh, for me, it was a learning experience all, all, all along. One of the best assignments uh, that I, that I was, um, long-term long assignments that I was photographing for AFP was the space shuttle program. And that was, for me, it was, it, it was an, an incredible experience. Since I was a kid, I was always interested in the space program uh, as well as astronomy. So I, I'd get up early in the morning and watch the Apollo launches and the moonwalks and uh, pretty much the whole, followed the whole space program. I had never seen a, a launch until, uh, until I went down to photograph one. And so uh, to, to see one in person was just, was just pretty amazing. Is that a special lens you took that last one with? Uh, this is with the fisheye lens. You get a little distortion when you, uh, when you tilt it down from the horizon. But we were on this, uh, the rotating surface structure, which is a, a, a gantry that covers up the shuttle uh, as they prepare it for launch. And about 12 hours before launch, they, they, ro they roll it back to, um, to expose the orbiter plus the, plus the rocket. And I was able to get a position on top of the, this the gantry looking straight down onto the uh, to the shuttle there. Um, this is the Atlantis, which was the, um, uh, the uh, shuttle that flew the final mission of the, of the program. Um, there are the man, the man uh, spot where we would actually shoot the launches was at the media center, which was three miles away. But we were able to put up a lot of remote control cameras around the launch pad uh, closer in. Th this is not a manned position, as, as you might be able to figure out, that uh, this is pretty close to the actual launch pad. But we could put up cameras that were uh, triggered by sound, and so the, the sound of the space shuttle's engines would, would actually trigger the camera. And then about two hours after launch, we would be allowed to go out and collect our cameras and the disk and find out if that camera actually worked. Sometimes, sometimes they didn't work, the triggers might not work, or maybe the batteries ran out. But uh, for the most part, they worked, they worked pretty well. And uh, this is the, the landing of uh, the Atlantis uh, shuttle on July um, in 2011. Uh, this is a, the, uh, the final landing of the, of the final space shuttle mission. So this, this was the end of the 30-year uh, pro space shuttle program that had uh, 135 missions and uh, built the International Space Station and uh, did quite a bit of uh, research putting up uh, satellites like the Hubble Space Telescope. In uh, 2001, I was uh, working with AFP in, uh, I, uh, my wife and I live in Manhattan, and so uh, I was on September 11th, I was, I was at home and a photographer had called me and said there's a, two planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. And so I, so I went down and on the, actually on the subway and got out at the City Hall at, at, uh, stop and was able to uh, photograph. I, I was there actually before the, the towers had collapsed, so uh, I was there pretty much most of the morning. You may have seen this picture uh, uh, recently. At the, toward the end of August, the woman in this picture uh, died. She came, became fairly well known um, when we found out her name, which was which is Marcy Borders, and uh, over the years, I think she became well known because the, the picture itself got a fair amount of uh, attention right after the uh, September 11th attacks in, in, in the days and weeks following it. Um, and it, it uh, she had a pretty rough life, uh, from what I understand by the by the news articles. And in um, toward the end of August, she was diagnosed with stomach cancer and then eventually died. I think she was 42, uh, which, is, which is pretty young. The second, the other picture that got a lot of attention from the, the, the Trade Center coverage that I did was uh, this man walking through uh, the debris. And uh, I didn't really notice until after I was editing through the pictures uh, while we were sending them that he's still carrying the briefcase in his left hand. And he's, he's got a, a cloth covering his face with his uh, right hand. And Fortune Magazine used this on the cover of their issue uh, following September 11th. They had. Um, they were. They didn't. They didn't know at that time who uh, who this man was. And eventually, he actually called up the magazine and he said, "That's that's me undercover." So, one of the editors from Fortune called me and said, "We, um, we found out who this guy is. Uh, can you photograph him for our next issue?" So, it turns out he lives in New Jersey, and I, I went over and he had saved his suit and uh, and the briefcase. So I photographed him in the in the suit and the briefcase for the for the following issue. 
Uh, we did, do quite a bit of sports. Uh, the, the last sports assignment I did was uh, the US Open tennis over in, in Queens. Uh, there was this uh, pretty, uh, pretty big match between the two Williams sisters, uh, Venus and Serena. So uh, that, that, was, that was pretty entertaining. Uh, you, uh, tennis is always uh, pretty fun, it's, uh, especially at the, at the tennis center uh, uh, over in Flushing. It's a, it's a pretty nice facility. And if you ever wondered uh, what um, whole gaggle of photographers look like uh, at one of these events, uh, the, uh, apparently we were, we were on the, the uh, network feed uh, of, the, of the match toward the end, and somebody snapped a picture and posted, the, posted it, so it, it, it's pretty funny. I'm, uh, uh, I'm down in the corner in, in the, on, the, on the front row there. So it's, uh, 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 it, it was a pretty funny moment of all, all of us. Cr it, it looks like we're, I think the, the telephoto lens compresses the picture a little bit. It looks like we're smashed in there quite a bit, but there's a little bit of room between each of us, a little, <laughs> little bit of work room. Um, but I think everybody here came to see pictures of, uh, pictures of stars, pictures of the night sky, or uh, pictures of uh, various astronomical events. Um, this is the, Grand, this is the uh, Milky Way over the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's a site that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wondrous site when you, when you actually see this, when you go out to places like the Grand Canyon, when you go out to areas where um, there's not much uh, civilization or light pollution and it's it's the sky that's above us that's above us every night no matter where we live and this is really what we should really be seeing from everywhere that, that we live and uh, two-thirds of the population of the US can't see the Milky Way from where they live just due to light pollution and and so this is something that um, I've been uh, uh, partially involved in the um, uh, I've been lucky enough to be involved in some artists in residence programs at, uh, at national parks. There's about 30 national parks that have these programs. They invite artists to come to the park and, and do their art. And, um, and they've invited lots of different, different types of artists over the years. Part of the uh, application process is that you write up a proposal for what uh, your project is. And I always address the preservation of, of the night sky and, and preservation of, the, of a dark sky uh, really as a resource, like, like the, the way a national park preserves uh, the land and the water and the air um, around it. And national parks are a great places. One reason a lot of people go to national parks is to see something like this. They want to, they want to see the stars. They want to see the, uh, the night sky without any interference, without any, any light pollution. And so the places like the Grand Canyon um, are really amazing places to do just to to, uh, to see this guy and also to do this kind of photography. Uh, I plan my trips around the phases of the moon so that uh, usually something like a um, the the full moon is just way too bright for for a lot of night uh, nighttime photography because it, wa it washes out a lot of the a lot of the sky and a lot of the stars. Uh, I usually go uh, when there there's a crescent phase uh, usually just before or after a uh, the new moon is is a perfect time to go. Uh, this is a, the moon rising um, over the south rim of the Grand Canyon. It's just barely above the horizon, and you get this uh, like a sunrise or sunset. You get this nice orange light um, if you if you look carefully at a sunrise or a sunset. Uh, the sun is very orangish, and the, the light on the landscape is very warm in color. It's it's a very yellow or very uh, very orange color, and it's the same with the moon. There's a lot of haze, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of particles in the air right along the horizon, you, you get this nice orange, uh, orange light. Am I looking at moonlight or sunlight on the uh, rock? You're looking at moonlight. You're looking at a... At so a the moon is behind you. Uh, the moon is to my right. There's the, um, you can see the shadow, uh, uh, the shadow from, from, from this rock formation here. And so the moon would be off to the, off to the right side of the frame. And, uh, uh, so I'm looking. I'm looking roughly north in the picture. So east would be to the uh, to the right side. Uh, and I, um, throughout all my uh, the career in, in uh, photojournalism, um, I always mainly use try to use available light, the natural light um, th uh, that's out there for uh, for the photographs that I take. And um, so I so I do that with the with the night landscapes that I'm taking. I, um, I try to use the available light, and in this case. Uh, a great source of the veil light um, is the moon, uh, more, more or less a crescent moon. So the rocks are, are lit by moonlight? The rocks are totally lit by moonlight, yeah. And I mean, you could see the shadows along here, along here from 
uh, from the rock formations on, on this side of the uh, frame, or uh, this, uh, this big uh, formation here is, uh, is projecting this shadow al along this part of the rock. And you can see that the light source itself is pretty low along the horizon. I think uh, this shadow would be much further down, and of course this one would be for much further down in the frame if, if the moon were a lot higher. So is the moon full? No, this would be, this was a crescent moon, uh, probably maybe two or three days past the new moon. Uh, the moon itself is a, in, incredibly bright. Um, if you've ever been in a wilderness area on a full moon, you could take a hike and you wouldn't even need, you don't need your flashlight, even a, about a quarter moon. Uh, throws out enough light where you, you don't really need a flashlight. In fact, it's more of a hindrance because you're, you're, you're lighting up an area right in front of you and your, um, your, eyes are, uh, your eyes close down and all it sees is the area right in front of you and you're, you're missing an entire landscape in front of you that's, uh, that lit, that's lit very well by the moon. Uh, most of the exposures, uh, I'll, I'll go over that in the second half, but most of the exposures on, on the, the pictures that are lit by, uh, like this, like by the moon, or just the general sky pictures, uh, are about 30 second exposures. Uh, a lot of it depends on the ISO and the, uh, and the, and the lens that I have, but it's generally about a, a 30 second exposure. So the kind of photography that I'm doing, that I'm concentrating on now, it's much, much different than the journalism that I was doing. It's, it's very slow and I need to, I need a tripod and everything. You can't really handhold a, a picture at 30. Seconds, the, those are stars up there, right? right. Wouldn't you get lines? Uh, they, they, you would if you had a much longer exposure. With a pretty wide angle lens, generally the, the, uh, the trailing, the streaking of the stars is, is kept to a minimum. If you blew this up quite a bit, you could probably see a, a, a little bit of line on the, uh, on the stars. But then um, even in a pretty, large, pretty big enlargement of this, this image, uh, the stars seem fairly sharp. Uh, at Petrified Forest uh, Na National Park, uh, I did a series of the moon setting. Uh, th this is a, whole, a series of frames of, of the moon every 10 minutes as it's set. So uh, one thing that still photography can, can do, especially with some of the night pictures, is, is they can show um, a, a time basically compressed into, into a frame. This is about uh, a two hour time period as the, as the moon is setting. And what I did here was I took uh, I think I took about 11 different images and then uh, it, uh, assembled them when I got, uh, when I got home uh, on my computer and with the uh, background image of the, uh, of the s after the sunset with the orange and the, uh, along the horizon if there. If you didn't do it with the computer, could you do it with the camera? You could do a multiple exposure. I, I find doing the individual images, you, you've just got a lot more control over, uh, over, the, over the final image that, that you have. But you could do a, you could do a multiple uh, exposure. Some, some cameras don't do that, but I think a lot of the cameras now, you could actually do multiple exposures uh, in the camera. It takes a lot more planning because you have to be fairly precise about the exposure uh, and you can't change anything afterwards. The, the great thing about uh, doing a multiple sequence uh, in, the, in the computer afterwards, you have a little bit more control over how the final picture looks. Uh, this is in a place called Wupaki National Monument, which is just to the north of Flagstaff in northern Arizona. And it's this incredible array of Pueblo sites that date back about 800 years. Uh, I did a two-week uh, artist in residence program there, and I went out uh, each night and, and found these just these unbelievable structures. Uh, this structure itself is about three stories high, and it really looks like it's, it's growing out of the rock there. It was uh, the, the, the way it was built. And um, so this is also something that's the, the moon was setting uh, um, uh, over my right shoulder, and the, the Milky Way is, is there in the southeast uh, with a little bit of glow of, uh, I think I was told that actually this is um, the glow from Phoenix, which is uh, about 100 miles away from there. So, uh, but the sky itself there uh, over Wupaki is, is quite dark, and you can see a lot of structure in the, in, in the Milky Way. Uh, but this all, the, the foreground part of, of the picture here is all, is all lit by uh, the setting moon. One of the other uh, pueblos, you can actually go inside one of the rooms. The, uh, the ceilings and the roofs are, are gone now from the building, so you can look straight up. And in this one, I'm looking uh, toward the north, uh, looking straight toward Polaris, the North Star. If, uh, if, you've, if you've been out at night for quite a, quite a long time, 
for, uh, you, can, you can see that the stars are actually moving. Um, but it, of course, it's not the stars that's moving, it's Earth, us, the, uh, us on the Earth that's moving. And it turns out that there's a star called Polaris, which is the, the North Star, and the axis of our Earth points straight to that star. So every other star uh, in the sky looks like it's rotating a around Polaris. So I located Polaris uh, just above the corner of, of this, this building. And uh, this is the equivalent of a one hour um, exposure. Uh, during the Photoshop uh, tutorial, I'll show you how I, how I assemble this. It's, it's, it, with the digital cameras now, uh, you're, you're limited as to how, many, how long the exposure could be. Uh, usually, after about five or six minutes, you pick up a lot of electronic noise in the image, which, uh, which makes it pretty unattractive. There are all these little blue and red dots that show up, and, and a lot of it almost looks like the old film grain uh, that shows up in the images. So uh, what I do is, uh, for, for something like this, I would take a series of two-minute exposures. So I took, so I took 30, 30 separate two-minute exposures, and so 30 times two is, is 60 minutes. Uh, each exposure was one second apart, so there was, there was a minimum amount of delay between each picture. And then once I assembled everything uh, together uh, with some software, you, you pick up the, uh, the illusion of the, start of the stars trailing around uh, the North Star. Each image is just a fraction of, of this arc, uh, and it, it shows the stars moving. And uh, like I said, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in the, in the Photoshop part. So the, this, again, is a natural moonlight? So the moon is lighting up this part uh, of, of the Pueblo, the, the, the bricks here. Uh, the moon is over uh, my left shoulder in this picture, because uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm looking due north. And it was, uh, again, like a crescent moon, probably a day or two before uh, um, the uh, the first quarter moon, so it's pretty it's pretty bright. It's um, like I said, the uh, the moon the moon doesn't have to be very big to actually be pretty bright and and um, and actually create shadows. Uh, if you're in a if you're in a wilderness area, if you're in a very dark area. Like the ten minute sequence of the moon setting, you have the face shot or something like that, and then the sky. You assemble this later. Yes. The shadows look so crisp. Yeah, uh, the, 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 usually uh, something like this, it'll, it'll, uh, the, the base image that I used for this one had the shadows, uh, had this entire part of the uh, structure lit. And then uh, as, the, as time went on, uh, the shadow went across, the, uh, actually went up the face of this wall. But then when you, when you assemble everything, only the, the lighter parts of each image shows through. The, the black actually is treated uh, in the software as transparent. So if, if, if there's a shadow up here, then the bricks uh, just actually show through the shadow. Uh, so if you could think of, of black as being transparent in an image like this, then the, the initial uh, part that's uh, part of the image that's, that's lit, such as all these bricks, is the main part that shows through. Uh, and then the, uh, anything that's, that's dark in the, su in the subsequent I images um, doesn't show up at all. So, you, you, uh, it, it's a matter of determining where you want to actually start with your image, and then um, a, a after that, if, if things become darker, if things become lighter, then, then the rest of the, for example, if the, if the shadow became, it went to the left, then more and more of this wall would show up. Uh, and, and so, uh, because more and more of those bricks would, would become light. So it's a, it's a matter of just trying to visualize how, how this, this is gonna work. Um, in your, uh, uh, with the, when you finally assemble all the images. So you took 31 second shots? I took uh, 30 two minute uh, images. So 30 times two is 60. So you get 60 minutes worth of, uh, or worth of images on this one picture. But it takes you an hour and a half to shoot. Pardon? It takes you an hour and a half to shoot it because there's a minute between exposures. Is that what you said? One second between one exposures. Second. Yeah, so just over an hour to shoot, shoot the image. Uh, you have to keep the time between each image uh, as short as possible, and, and one second is the shortest that I could do it on the, the uh, electronic trigger that I have. If, uh, if, you, if you do any longer, you'll start to see, um, you'll start to see gaps in these, uh, in these arcs. Uh, so the, th this star is creating this arc uh, throughout each, each exposure that you're making. Um, and if you wait too long between each exposures, you'll, you'll start to see uh, little dark gaps between, uh, between those images. You see dotted lines. 
Pardon? You'll see dotted lines. A lot of dotted lines, right? How do you avoid the aircraft drill? You don't. Uh, you just have. Uh, you just have to you just have to deal with them, especially in something like this. Uh, I think I was pretty lucky in this one. There's a couple. There's actually a. Uh, I can't I can't really blow this image up. There's a what what looks like it might be a satellite trail, like a brief satellite trail right there. I was pretty lucky with this one where you where you don't get what I what I usually do though, and and when I do the star trails is that I'll I'll shoot for roughly about an hour and a half, uh, so that there's a little bit of over, and then I'll take the best. The, the middle 30, the, the middle hour out of it. Uh, so in case there is a, an airplane coming through. So sometimes you just can't avoid that though, depending on, depending on where you are. The, the, the way to avoid it is to go to some place that's totally remote, that, that doesn't have any aircraft flying over it. Uh, I went to the Rocky Mountain National Park for, uh, for two weeks and uh, that was a great experience because I had been used to shooting a lot in the American Southwest in Arizona and, and New Mexico. And there was, there's a lot of water there. It's a, it's a much damper uh, uh, environment. So, so it was pretty interesting. Uh, this view, uh, uh, people like this picture because initially they're not really sure what, what they're looking at. And uh, it looks like a star. It looks sort of like a star-shaped picture with stars in it. And uh, what it is is I was uh, walking along um, the shore of Bear Lake one night, probably very late in the night. And... Uh, and I look, looked up through a grove of trees, and so this is, imagine looking straight up through a grove of trees, and this is what, this is what I saw, which is the summer Milky Way stretching across in, in the middle there. Um, I actually went back a couple times to shoot this picture because there was, uh, there are oftentimes there are very thin clouds that, that you can't really see with your eyes, but then they, you, the, the camera picks them up pretty easy because it's much more sensitive than your eyes. Uh, so I went back and I, and I managed to get this this picture, which uh, uh, which I like quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot lot more water there than in the, in the American Southwest, so there were interesting photos with reflections off of off of lakes, especially if the if the water is quite still. And the um, uh, they had some astronomy programs there, which were which was pretty interesting. They had astronomy night, which they do every every two weeks during the summer. They have two. Uh, Astronomy clubs from the, the nearby towns come and set up telescopes, and they have quite a few people actually actually stay in the park or come into the park uh, to look through telescopes. And for me, that made a nice uh, series of pictures because uh, uh, usually an observer or an amateur astronomer sitting at a telescope doesn't really move very much for, especially for the 30 seconds it took to take this picture. Uh, you could see people moving around with their red flashlights. Um, but then you get you get quite a bit of the uh, the sky in the in the photo as well. I tried a similar um, uh, angle that I did at uh, Rocky Mountain at a place called Chaco Culture National Park, which is in north uh, eastern northwestern New Mexico. Uh, it's another uh, incredible collection of pueblo sites, and these date back probably about 1,100 or 1,200 years. Uh, uh, I got permission to shoot at night. They usually close the park at night, uh, so I went out. And this, this again, is looking straight up with a super wide angle lens uh, out of a, uh, the room in uh, this one pueblo called Pueblo Bonito. Is Polaris in the window? Uh, in the window on the on this side, on the left side is Polaris. Uh, this is a window that faces north. So I, I, I tried to center it. It's almost centered, and. Uh, uh, it, this one was a difficult to frame. I'm uh, on the ground looking up through my camera on the tripod trying to frame it so I would take a few test pictures to see, see that everything was, was there. And then I, this, this was uh, also a, a one hour exposure, a series of exposures uh, that, that uh, added up to one hour. Yeah. Oh, uh, this was a, the size of the lens. This is a 16 millimeter uh, fisheye lens. So the, uh, uh, a fisheye lens on, I use uh, full frame 35 millimeter digital cameras. So uh, r roughly from side to side, it's almost a, a, a view of 180 degrees. Uh, so this is a pretty wide view. Uh, the reason next, see, that my two friends and I went to Chaco Culture, we were actually going to go there at some point during 2012. And uh, I looked on this map of eclipses and I saw that this uh, uh, annular eclipse in May of 2012 was going to uh, pass right right over Chaco Culture. So so we decided, well, let's go in May so we could see this eclipse. And it turned out to be a, a, a great trip. We scouted out this location. Uh, this is actually the same Pueblo, Pueblo Bonito. 
And this is a series uh, every five minutes uh, from the start of the eclipse uh, to the, where it becomes total right here. And then the, the, the sun uh, set uh, during the second half of the eclipse. But the uh, an, an annular eclipse is when the, the moon is at the furthest, one of the furthest point in its orbit. And so that you don't get, it doesn't cover up the entire surface of the sun. And so during the actual total phase, uh, you get this ring. Uh, they call it a ring of fire. And, and this is what, what you see during the total phase. The, uh, the black circles in the middle is, is the moon. You could, if you look real carefully, you could, you could see uh, outlines of, of some of the craters and moons along the edge of the, of the moon uh, silhouetted against the, uh, against the face of the sun. And so these were the, uh, all the solar pictures that I'll show you uh, were taken with uh, solar filters over the camera lenses that I use. Uh, and uh, just as a warning, you really need to be very careful if you do pictures of the sun or solar photography and um, use this, uh, this solar sunglass, um, uh, the, the protective filters to, to actually look at the sun if, if you do that and don't look at it with your, with your naked eye. Uh, as part of the, uh, the Chaco culture trip, I was doing a lot of pictures at, at night, of course, and um, one of the rangers took some interest in the photos I was taking because uh, he said they were, try they were uh, applying to the International Dark Sky Association for this uh, status, inter for uh, Dark Sky National Park status. So he, they ended up using a, a photo that I took on the cover and the back cover of their, the report that they did uh, it, it, as an application which then they, uh, they eventually got accepted, I think, toward the end of 2013. Uh, and and they're, so they're now designated uh, an International Dark Sky National Park. Uh, comets are another great thing that's, that's interesting to photograph. Uh, this is uh, Comet Panstar off to the left side of the, of the, of the image. I, uh, I subscribe to uh, Sky and Telescope and, uh, and look at a lot of astronomy websites. And they often tell you what's going to be happening in the future. Uh, up in the sky. The great thing about the universe is much of it is very regular. Things happen on a regular basis. And, um, and be because uh, astronomers know the exact orbits of, of things like comets and planets and the moon, uh, you can determine where things are uh, in the sky during the, uh, at any particular uh, date and time. And the, uh, uh, in March of 2013, uh, there was a, uh, the prediction, of course, was that the uh, that the comet and the moon would be fairly close in the sky at sunset on this particular day, March 13th. So I joined my uh, friend of mine lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I joined him out there and he said, well, let's go down to the very large array, which is a, a big radio telescope uh, observatory in southern New Mexico. If you saw the movie Contact, uh, Jodie Foster collects all of her data at the very large ar uh, array from the, uh, from the civilization in, in Vega. So we went down there, and um, uh, this is with a 300 millimeter lens um, on my camera. Not a very long lens, and uh, and it it, it uh, we we saw a very thin crescent moon. I think one of the thinnest that, that I've seen uh, since I've been uh, photo photographing things in the sky. And there, we we uh, positioned ourselves with a uh, with the with the antennas from the VLA uh, along the horizon there. Uh, the next year, I went back. Uh, with my friend, and we camped out, or not really camped out, we hung out overnight to watch the total eclipse of the moon, and which just happened uh, at the end of September. I don't know if how, how many people here uh, saw, the, saw the total lunar eclipse. Uh, this is a similar, similar event uh, where, where the moon completely entered the Earth's shadow. And uh, this is another series, series that I did. Um, this is uh, the, the whole, the total three hours and 40 minutes of the eclipse um, all seen in one frame. So from the, from the start on the left side uh, through to totality in the middle where the moon turns a very reddish color uh, to, the, to the very end on the, on the right side. And I, I shot this over one of the uh, antennas at the VLA, which was conveniently positioned in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, right, uh, in, the, in the right angle. Uh, I think you were conveniently positioned. Right, right. Uh, the, this is uh, a total of 45 images. Uh, What's the second line above it? This uh, is Mars. This little, the, these little dots are, are Mars up here. And I think this, the star Spica was d directly below the moon, which, which is following. So uh, uh, the brighter, these two bright items, um, Mars and Spica, follow, follow along the moon 
uh, in its path through the sky during the eclipse. And uh, this is a total of 45 exposures uh, that eventually I, I assembled on this on the one image of the of the VLA antenna. So the exposures varied quite a bit from from this in this image from the the, the foreground exposure to the uh, to the different exposures during the eclipse. Uh, if, if you're ever out in a remote area during a total eclipse, it, it's just amazing experience. I know uh, another person had told me about this the September eclipse. They were in upstate New York. Uh, when the moon becomes total, the sky becomes very dark, almost like, almost like a new moon. And if the Milky Way is up, you all of a sudden see the Milky Way, which is uh, an unusual experience since it's a full moon and you're seeing the Milky Way, which would generally be fairly impossible since the, the uh, uh, full moon is pretty bright and it, it washes out a lot of the sky. So the, uh, this is the moon during the to total eclipse uh, up in the corner there and uh, the VLA antenna in the center and the Milky Way was uh, rising in the, in the east about, uh, this is just about 2.20 in the morning. So we were, uh, we were out there pretty late uh, hanging out around the antenna, so and uh, but the but, moon looks full. Pardon? The moon looks full. Well, it's it's uh, it's slightly overexposed in this picture. Oh. So the uh, I mean I'm exposing for the the background sky and and the uh, and the Milky Way, uh, but there, there's the moon and uh, I, I think that's Mars right next to it. The what the the bright object. Uh, if you ever go down to the southern hemisphere. It's a, it's a whole new experience of people who've been uh, below the equator. You see a, a much different sky, and you're able to see these two objects, which are the, uh, the large and the small Magellanic clouds. They're, they're uh, satellite galaxies to our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, when you see it in the sky, it's just these pretty interesting effect of almost like cotton balls just being suspended in the sky. And uh, to, to, to see them, it's just... You're not really sure what you're seeing because they're they're very fuzzy, but they're they're quite large, and uh, and to me they made a, a really great photo uh, against the Australian landscape. This is in northwestern Australia where the uh, there's very few people that live there, and so that the the skies are just uh, jet black at night. It's it's probably one of the darker skies that that I've ever seen. In uh, in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, my friend and I were out trying to shoot a few pictures as the sun was setting, and these storms came in, and we thought, well, this is, this is going to ruin our night. But we stayed out for a little bit uh, near one of the geysers, and in the distance, uh, there were these storms, uh, uh, lightning, and you could, you could hear the thunder, and, and the lightning itself uh, lit up these clouds. So it's technically not a picture of stars, but it's, it was this uh, wild scene that we were, we were seeing out there while we were um, uh, trying to shoot other, other stuff. And uh, um, over by uh, the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone, uh, you, you got these great um, plumes of, of steam coming out of the out of the water. And then the, the Northern Milky Way here, you could see uh, the, the, the Pleiades cluster here, and uh, I think Andromeda up here. Uh, so uh, Yellowstone is another one of those great national parks where people go and they they um, they go to see uh, both the landscape, but also they want to they want to see a sky that, that looks like this. Uh, comets are, um, like I said before, comets are a pretty interesting, um, uh, pretty interesting objects to photograph. This is Comet Lovejoy, taken uh, earlier this year, in January of this year. There was uh, uh, it, this was one that passed uh, fairly close to the Earth, and it was slightly visible through uh, by your eye and through binoculars and through through a telescope. It showed up very nicely in photographs. Uh, oddly enough, it, it, it showed up even better in photographs. So you had this uh, very greenish glow to the head of the comet, and then uh, then the the, the quite a uh, quite wide tail. Uh, this again was with a 300 millimeter lens, so the, the, the angle of view is actually fairly wide. The, the comet itself was was pretty big in, in the night sky, uh, but to me, the the better picture was actually a wider picture. This is just with my 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens. Uh, I had it set at 100, 102 millimeters, and so I was getting this cluster called called the Pleiades, which is a quite bright cluster that you could see with your naked eye in in the sky, and the the comet uh, appearing to zoom right past it, even though it's this is in our solar system, and the and the Pleiades are, are um, uh, several scores of uh, light years away. But to me, this was a better picture uh, than than just the comet itself. It actually 
put it into a little bit of perspective of where it is in the sky. Where did you shoot this to get the fainter stars? Uh, yeah, this is this is a uh, this and the previous picture. Uh, I've got this small device that I'll show you uh, that that tracks the uh, tracks the stars in the sky. So it follows the stars, so you can take much longer exposures. And this was in in Taos, New Mexico. So um, uh, I actually shot a little bit from northern New Jersey, uh, it, and then uh, I went out to meet my friend in Albuquerque, and then we drove up to Taos, where uh, the sky was in, in just. Uh, Pretty dark and very very clear uh, out there. It's cropped slightly, not not very much. I mean, the the tail itself was quite long, and so uh, I think a three three hundred millimeter can span about seven or eight degrees uh, uh, of view in in the, in the sky. So the uh, the tail of the uh, the comet was actually uh, quite long. You can see how this is a 102 millimeter lens, and so you can see how long the, the tail is in this in, in this image. Uh, you might wonder, well, what what can I shoot in the in New York City? I mean, what can you see from here? And uh, of course, we could see the sun sometimes. Uh, we could see it, and this was uh, a few years ago, in 2012, the transit of Venus. Uh, this is the planet Venus, uh, basically eclipsing the sun. Um, I'm a member of the Amateur Astronomers Association, and we had a lot of, uh, of viewing places around New York City. Uh, a half hour before the transit, it started to rain. And so we were, uh, I was with a whole group of people, and we were thinking, well, should we put our, should we stay here, or should we, uh, sh should we wait until the rain stops? And it eventually did stop, and we were able, able to get a couple views through the, through the clouds of, of the transit. It was, it was I think, well worth the, uh, well, well worth the wait. Uh, this is with a pretty long lens, a, a 400 millimeter lens with a, a 1.7 uh, x teleconverter. So it's the equivalent of a 680 millimeter lens, uh, which is roughly the size of a lot of telescopes. Um, a, a telescope and a lens are roughly the same instrument. It's it's uh, uh, the, the the same idea of of trying to magnify distant distant objects. Uh, we actually saw the very start of it. Uh, there's this there's this effect called the eyedropper effect where you, you get uh, this uh, effect of, the, of, of Venus uh, coming onto the, the face of the sun, and you get this strange um, effect of it not being a clean uh, a break with the, with the very edge of the sun. Uh, so I managed to get that, and I think we saw about 10 minutes of the transit at the start, uh, and then clouds came through for about a half hour or 40 minutes, and then we saw another uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, uh, of, of the transit, but I think uh, there, there were quite a few people at the observing site I was at, so I think a lot of people got a pretty good look. What causes the eyedropper? I think it's I think it's uh, it's some sort of uh, diffraction effect with that that deals with the uh, I mean people that actually observe the transit uh, through solar uh, filter telescopes see the same thing, uh, so it might have it might might be an optical effect with the with the lenses. No, no, it has nothing to do with the actual, uh, with the Venus or the Sun. It's, it's just the, the way that we're observing it here. We're also observing it through atmosphere of, of lots of air and lots of turbulence and everything. I was just trying to remember, I think there was an experiment that they confirmed with Einstein where you were supposed to see a star, but it was in a different position with the, the Sun, the Sun's gravity. The Sun's gravity, yeah, well, but, yeah. yeah but, but Venus is between the Sun and us uh, versus a star, which is between... Uh, which the sun is between the star and, and the observer uh, in, in that case. Uh, the other things that, that can be photographed from, from New York are, the, of course, the moon and, and the planets. Uh, this is Venus and Mars uh, in this uh, very small, very tight conjunction that happened on February 20th uh, earlier this year. Uh, this, uh, this is over the west side. I went out to Central Park along the reservoir, which, uh, it, at least in Manhattan, you can get actually a fairly low view of, of the horizon, both on the, on the west side and the, and the east side. Uh, and so the, um, to me, the combining the, the objects in the sky with something along, uh, uh, something familiar along the ground um, gives you a better perspective on, on how everything fits into uh, both the sky and the land. And uh, recently in October, um, and actually still going on now, is a uh, this planetary alignment and a, and a conjunction. Uh, this is Venus up here, which, which looks very large, mainly because it's behind a cloud, so the, 
Venus itself is pretty bright, and it's uh, being slightly distorted by a cloud, so that looks bright. Uh, Mars is this uh, fairly dim point right there, and then Jupiter is down below. So uh, the, it, was a, it was a great sight to see. The, the bad news is that all this happens in the early morning hours before sunrise. So for a few days, I, I got up uh, usually about maybe 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, um, which I don't, don't normally do. I'm more of a night person, and I don't know about people here. And I went out to the, uh, to the reservoir in Central Park and walked over toward the west side, so I was able to look to the east uh, as the planets rose and uh, looking toward the buildings along Fifth Avenue. So this is on uh, October 7th. The, the three planets um, are, are somewhat lined up as they're, as they're rising here. Uh, the next day, uh, the, uh, I, I got up before, the, um, before Jupiter and Mars came up. So the, the crescent moon and Venus here uh, made a really nice picture reflected in the, in the reservoir in the middle of Central Park. And shortly after this, a whole bank of clouds came through and obscured the whole thing. So, so that was it for, uh, for my morning. But at least, uh, at least it made for a nice picture of uh, the moon and Venus. On, on October 9th, uh, I, I was trying to get all three. This is Venus up here. Uh, this is a small crescent moon here. Uh, Jupiter and Mars are right here. You can sort of see them through the clouds. I'll, I'm actually going to use this picture in the Photoshop um, tutorial so I can could, I could blow this up and you can actually see the planets uh, once we blow up this image. This, this happened, to ha happened to include all three planets plus the, plus the moon. Uh, so this is around 5, 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, and I, you actually don't see too many runners out there uh, at, at that hour of the morning. They, uh, on October 12th, the, uh, uh, the sky was quite clear. Uh, the moon, of course, was gone, uh, much higher in the sky. Uh, but, the, but the water was quite still. And um, this is looking sort of the, toward the east, a little bit to the northeast, uh, as the uh, Jupiter is a bright I mean, Venus is the bright planet here, and uh, the planets are lined up along here. Uh, this is a wide angle. This is a 28 millimeter lens on the uh, on the Sony camera that I use. So the uh, for for all of these pictures, let's see. I think this is a um, oh, this is a 7200 millimeter lens at 70 millimeters. Uh, this is my shorter lens on the Sony at at 40 millimeters, and this is the Sony lens at 70 millimeters. So for a lot of these objects and for a lot of the photography that I do, you don't need really long telephoto lenses. You don't need telescopes. I don't shoot through telescopes. Because um, what I'm doing is trying to show much more, I think, of the landscape, the, the objects in the sky with the, with the landscape. And so the shorter lenses, lenses really help. Um, I remember last winter was quite cold, as I think everybody remembers here. We had a pretty, pretty frigid winter in New York City, but so these friends and I decided to go someplace that was even colder, which was up in the, uh, up in the polar regions, this uh, um, archipelago called Svabard, which is an area controlled by Norway, and it's about 600 miles from the, uh, from the North Pole. As it happens, there were two points of land in the, uh, above the Arctic Circle that were uh, going to, uh, where a, a total solar eclipse was going to be visible, and only just, just those two points of land. Uh, the eclipse itself went over a, a big area of the, uh, of the North Arctic Ocean, but you would have had to be in a boat. And one of the places was this uh, island called Spitsbergen. So uh, I joined uh, two, two members of the uh, astronomy club, the AAA that, that I belong to, uh, were signed up for the trip. And the more they told me about it, the more interesting it sounded to me. So I ended up signing up and, and going with them. This was the uh, eclipse viewing site, the morning of the eclipse on March 20th. We're, uh, we're all bundled up, and these are, these are two, ca two, camera, uh, two cameras that I had set up for, for the eclipse. It was this incredible sight. Um, even without the eclipse, the, the landscape was pretty striking, this area of snow and ice uh, covering everything. It was, it was uh, mid-March, so it was still pretty cold. The, the morning of the eclipse, it was uh, two degrees Fahrenheit, so we were, uh, we were quite bundled up. And this is uh, the scene just a few minutes before totality, you could, this, you could still, the sun was still fairly bright, but the, the light was actually dimming as the eclipse went on. This was um, uh, just, like I said, just a few minutes before totality. So it was almost like a, a sunset where, where you see the light dimming and the shadows are quite long because the sun is, 
the sun just happens to be pretty low on the horizon since we were pretty far north. We were at 78 degrees north latitude. So the sun itself, this is about as high as the sun got during the days when the, the five days that we were there. Uh, I think it was about, uh, it got as high as 12 degrees above the horizon, which is pretty low. If you can imagine a, uh, the sun uh, just less than an hour before sunset, uh, that's the way it looked at high noon in, in Spitsbergen. For, for a photographer, it was great because you got this great light the entire day. It'd be this nice low light. Um, when there were no clouds, it was quite um, almost like a, a, a constant sunset or a sunrise. But we went from this view uh, where you, could, you, you, you saw uh, a little bit of the sun. All of a sudden, it was like someone had shut off, uh, shut off the light and it went, went uh, almost completely dark. It was quite dark. And uh, you saw this black circle in the sky surrounded by the corona. And uh, the, we, were, we were surrounded. Of course, we were, we were in within the, the shadow of the moon as it was racing across the surface of the Earth. And people ask, well, how, how dark was it? And I, was, I remember that uh, I was looking down at my camera to change some of the settings on the camera. And I, I have a camera that has a, has a small window with the readout. You, you could see the, uh, the information there. And I couldn't see the, the window, the information in the window. There's a, there's a light that I could turn on in my camera that, I, that you do at nighttime. And I had to turn that on to actually see the, the settings so, so I could change it. But also, in this picture, um, you can see the, the backs of people's cameras, the lights along here, uh, are, are lighting up. So uh, it was like, to me, it was like a very, very dark uh, twilight. Um, and with the sun just hanging, hanging up in the sky, it was a very surreal uh, experience to see this. And this was at uh, uh, a point called the third contact, where the, the moon is slightly moving off the surface of the, the face of the sun now. And uh, so you, you get this uh, uh, small bit of the sun peeking around, around the moon. Uh, but it's still quite dark. You could, see the, uh, you could still see lights on the backs of, of people's cameras uh, uh, right in front of me there. Uh, this is with the wide-angle lens uh, that, that I had set up on a tripod, and with the telephoto lens, I got some much, much closer views. Uh, uh, and this is right at the what's called second contact, where the, the, the moon, it's, it's essentially about a few seconds before it becomes completely total, and you see the entire corona, and you see this uh, uh, tiny glimmer of sunlight on the left-hand side. What they call the diamond ring. This is a diamond ring, yes, yes. And uh, this is during the, uh, during the total phase. You could, you could see some uh, fairly large solar prominences on, the, uh, on this side of the sun here. Uh, so it was a pretty, uh, pretty remarkable sight. Uh, this is the actual, the, the, during the center middle of the totality, which lasted about two and a half minutes. It's not very long. So you don't have too much time to either take pictures or, or watch, uh, watch the, uh, the total phase itself. And after I got home, oh, one second. A after I got home, uh, uh, I assembled this, this sequence. Uh, this is the, the sun every five minutes during the, um, just over two hours of the, of the total eclipse from, from the start of the partial phase uh, through the total phase and then uh, toward the end. Uh, there's a question in the back. Your exposure times? During the, uh, during the total phases, this was, um, uh, let's see, I had the original uh, exposure at, at, this is 250th of a second at f11 uh, at ISO 400. This is with the, with the long lens. Uh, there's sort of a, uh, a plan that you have to have for an eclipse, mainly because the total phase is so short. Uh, what I did was I determined the exposure with the um, uh, solar filter. I used um, uh, these gels that I put, that I tape over the front of the lens uh, as a solar filter. And to, to get the um, to get the partial partial phase uh, of of the eclipse there, and what I did is I decided to set the exposure so that during the total phase I wouldn't have to change the exposure that much, just uh, just a little bit, and and so this uh, this is a, this is the. Uh, a, a, an image of the sun without the solar filter on. I've taken the solar filter off, and so this is a 250th at, at f11. And so I, I kept it at that setting for, for much of the eclipse, but there's also um, uh, a feature on the, on the Nikon cameras. You could do this auto bracketing where uh, it'll, it'll bracket the exposure. Uh, it'll it'll uh, expose more, expose less. 
uh, over a series of images. And so uh, I did that. This is, this is actually a 40th of a second at, at, at F11 at ISO 400. <laughs> so I just changed the shutter speed. I slowed the shutter speed down and uh, to get more exposure, to get more exposure on the, on the corona uh, surrounding the sun. And then, uh, and then I, I went the other way as well, uh, 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 decreased the shutter speed so that it, um, it got a little bit more of I images like this. And then, and then it's, it's just a matter of looking at everything uh, once, uh, once, you get, once I got back to my hotel or once I got back home here to New York City and uh, just looking at the images and seeing, seeing what works best. How did you determine the exposure? Is that the, is what? Did you just bracket like crazy or did you uh, spot meter? Or? For, the, for the partial eclipse with the uh, filters over my lens, uh, I just put the camera on the spot meter and just metered, metered the sun and then I did a few... Before the eclipse started, I did a few test exposures and, and saw what looked the best. Uh, and so with, with uh, pictures of things like the sun and, then, and, and the moon, you can actually do uh, an exposure test. You could use a, the light meter in your camera to determine the exposure. Uh, let's see. Oh, so uh, the trip continued, and we, we were uh, uh, the, the eclipse itself was pretty amazing. Uh, I had never seen a total solar eclipse, so the whole experience was was pretty amazing. But uh, that night, we, we were, I was also signed up for an aurora viewing expedition, which uh, I went on every night thinking, I, I'm, I'm so far north, and I'm, and I'm there during this time when you can actually see the aurora that I really wanted to see one. And, uh, and so that night, uh, we hadn't seen one for two days. And that, the night of the eclipse, uh, there was a, we were out uh, a little bit away from the town, about 10, 10 miles or so from the town, and uh, saw, this, saw the aurora along the horizon. And it was just a, 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 um, yet another, uh, this kind of incredible natural scene of, the, uh, of the, the solar wind interacting with the Earth's upper atmosphere. And so this, uh, it, the, the light itself grew and it formed a structure. Uh, initially, it looked a little bit, it almost looked solid up in the sky, but you could see, you could see stars behind it. And you could, see, of course, see stars in, in the photos here. And then it, it grew to be uh, enormous in the sky. It actually was, grew past the, uh, the point of our peripheral vision almost. Uh, this is a 14 millimeter lens on, my, on the Nikon that I have, which is an extremely wide view. It, it's, I think it's about 110 degrees uh, uh, from side to side. And, and as you can see, that the, the aurora goes past the, the side and, and the, the top of the image there. At, so at one point, the uh, aurora went, was moved str uh, straight above us. So, so I had to move, quickly move the camera uh, straight up. I had done a lot of research before just to figure out how people exposed, because I wasn't, I'd never shot one before, and I wasn't really sure how people determine the exposures. Um, and the, the one advice that I read was to try to keep them as short as possible since the, uh, the light itself moves quite a bit. And if the exposures are too long, you get a lot of blurring in the structure. And so you don't, you don't, get, this, you don't get the fine lines that are running, running through the aurora itself. Uh, I had done some exposures of, of the sky before we saw the aurora and came up with a, a rough exposure of about eight seconds at, um, at f2.8 at 3200 uh, ISO. So uh, I stuck with that and it managed, managed to be pretty good. The light, the light itself um, the, from the aurora didn't, it didn't overexpose and so I was able to get a fairly good exposure on pretty much most of it. You could see it's, it's fairly bright along here, uh, verging on a little bit of overexposure, but uh, for the most part, the, that, that one exposure worked out pretty good. Uh, when I, uh, the ne actually, the next day, the, I had some fairly, fairly good success with, the, um, uh, with both the eclipse and the aurora pictures. Uh, the next day, this image was the uh, astronomy picture of the day. Uh, NASA runs this website called Astronomy Picture of the Day, and they feature uh, generally a lot of deep space pictures, but, but also a lot of uh, ground-based pictures and uh, they liked this image that I had taken of the eclipse itself. Um, and the same picture ended up on the cover of this book. Uh, travel Quest is the travel company that, that organized the trip. They, um, they, they do a lot of regular tours to different parts of the world, but they also specialize in uh, e eclipse tours where they'll, they'll take you to where there's going to be a solar eclipse and uh, uh, provide the hotels and the transportation and everything. 
so they put together a book about people's uh, uh, thoughts and their remembrances of the eclipse itself, and they, they liked uh, uh, this image that I shot uh, for, for the cover of the book. And the August issue of Sky and Telescope used one of the uh, Aurora pictures uh, on their gallery page where they feature a lot of uh, pictures done by some of the readers. So the last big trip uh, that, I, that I went on, oh yes? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, when you were taking the eclipse shots, right. you had, were you with at least two cameras? It looks like you had one the camera you used and they did the group out there, another camera is you know, like the, with the close up on the actual camera. Yeah, I had two cameras, one with a wide angle lens and one with a telephoto lens shooting the eclipse itself. I had a third camera just around my neck so I could take pictures of, of just the scene around me. So, but mainly the two cameras shooting the uh, eclipse itself. It sounds like it keeps you busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I was probably doing too much. They, 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 do, they recommend, for total, if you've never seen a total eclipse, to actually watch it, to, to experience it. Uh, I tried to do that. I, sort of, I had this, like I said, I had this plan set up in my mind as to the pictures I would be taking once it went total. Uh, and so uh, I was sort of trying to do that and then remembering every, every few seconds to just sort of look up. Because a total eclipse, you could see, look at a total eclipse with your eyes. You don't need any protection on your eye. You're, you're just looking at the corona, the atmosphere surrounding the sun. So you're not actually looking at the sun. So uh, I'm, I'm busy trying to deal with the controls on my camera, but then also trying to look up to, to actually experience the whole, whole eclipse, which is uh, definitely worth it if you, if, you, if you ever can get to a place that, uh, where, where there is an eclipse. Do you have a tripod that you favor for this kind of work? I'll talk a little about, about the equipment um, when, I, when I go over the next couple uh, parts, but uh, I'll just get through the pictures now. If you have any equipment pictures, save that to the, ne the, the next hour and, and we'll, we'll talk, because I'll, I'll go over in detail a lot about the equipment. Um, and of course, there's lots of equipment in this store, which is it's pretty dangerous to have a, have a workshop like this in a camera store because you're bound to spend lots of money here. That's the way they work. Yeah, that's, yeah I'm sure that's, why, that's, that's how it works. Uh, the last big trip I went to was uh, to the Grand Canyon. I was an artist in residence at the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, most people take trips to the Grand Canyon and they go to the south rim, which is where a lot of the hotels and facilities are. Uh, the North Rim is a, is a whole different experience. Um, they're very, there's just one very large lodge, um, a pretty big campground there, uh, and it's much different. It's much darker than the South Rim just because there are fewer uh, facilities, fewer, um, uh, much less ar uh, artificial light there. And so the uh, experience there was great. I was there for three weeks and was able to go out pretty much every night and experiment with a lot of different techniques and, and see this incredible sky uh, uh, above the North Rim. And uh, uh, like I said, I use, some, I use pretty wide angle lenses for a lot of the landscapes just so I can get uh, a lot of the landscape features. But you realize how big things are in the sky. I mean, you, you think the, that the, uh, the Milky Way is up there. You need telescopes to photograph the Milky Way. But again, this is a, this is a 14 millimeter lens, which takes in a, a pretty wide view uh, of what you're taking a picture of, whether it's the landscape or the sky. And the Milky Way is a pretty substantial part of, of this image. And so this is with a very wide angle lens. So the, uh, you, you really don't need, uh, at least for, for, for things like the Milky Way, you don't really need uh, very, very long focal length lenses or definitely don't need a telescope. Uh, it was, uh, uh, again, I planned it around the phases of the moon so that uh, the new moon was in, this, in the, uh, the center of the time period that I was there, so I was able to get uh, uh, the, uh, the waning moon as it, as it went toward new moon, and then uh, the crescent moon as it, um, as it grew after, after the new moon phase. So uh, these scenes, a lot of the scenes, the, uh, the rocks, the foreground rocks here, and definitely the, the background area, uh, are lit by, this is, this is lit by the, the rising moon, so I'm, I'm up pretty... Um, well, late or pretty early, depending on your point of view, uh, uh, pho photographing this, this scene on the North Rim. And um, this is the setting, uh, the setting moon. You could see uh, some of the lights from the, from the, actually from the South Rim uh, on the opposite side. This is the, the other rim is 10 miles away if, if you go in a straight line, uh, straight across the canyon. Uh, and uh, there was uh, also this interesting conjunction going on. Um, 
the moon, which is the brighter object here, uh, and Venus and Jupiter were for, formed, uh, for a couple days, formed this interesting triangle in the sky as the moon um, moves through uh, this area of the sky. And uh, I also pay attention to the uh, orbits of the International Space Station. There are several websites that will tell you the predictions of where the, where the space station will be visible uh, depending on, on where you are. Or uh, you could put in New York and it'll tell you the days and the hours that, that it's visible. And it turns out that the, uh, the track of the space station this night over the Grand Canyon was uh, uh, pretty much going to parallel uh, Jupiter and Venus as it goes up in the sky. So this is a, this is a one minute exposure as the, as the space station is going, uh, uh, going through the sky past this, uh, uh, the trio of the two planets and the moon. I, did a, uh, I was able to experiment a lot uh, with something I had wanted to do, is to, which was to try to photograph uh, close-ups of plants. And it it's, can be very difficult because the uh, plants themselves are very, very fragile and the slightest breeze uh, causes them to move. And this is a 15 second exposure and I was doing anywhere between 15 and 30 second exposures. So I had to wait until the, the, the breeze stopped until it was uh, in completely still uh, because uh, also I'm extremely close to the plants, uh, almost doing a, a fairly uh, uh, close in close up with, a, with the setting, with the wide angle setting so I can get the sky. Uh, the thing I discovered was you could see a lot of the uh, patterns in the sky that, that were still visible, that are still re recognizable. Uh, you could still make out the Milky Way uh, here in the back as well as uh, s some constellations. Uh, trees are, uh, the, the pinion pines were uh, uh, fairly difficult because uh, uh, sometimes even without a breeze uh, you, could, you could see them move slightly and with, a, with an exposure at the length of 30 seconds or uh, uh, there, thereabouts any kind of movement would, would blur the, the tree itself and uh, er everything would be uh, would look blurry in the picture. So uh, sometimes I would spend an hour shooting the same, uh, the same uh, leaf or the same uh, part of a tree, which it must have looked pretty strange if you walked by and I'm sort of sitting there shooting, shooting the same thing over a pretty long period of time. Uh, the Milky Way was just this incredible sight. Uh, when, when you looked up uh, into, the, uh, into the sky as it, as it rose, this is, uh, uh, again, with a, well, with a 50 millimeter lens, which is, an, which is not a very long lens on a, uh, on a full frame camera. And it takes in quite a bit of the, uh, of the sky, but of course not, uh, uh, if, you, if you remember back to that, the first picture I showed you, the Milky Way itself was a pretty big structure uh, in that picture. And this is almost, a, almost looks like a telephoto view of, uh, of that part of the Milky Way. Uh, this is the area around uh, Sagittarius, the uh, uh, constellation of Sagittarius here. Scorpius is down here. And uh, this particular part of the Milky Way is, is always pretty interesting. There's a lot of um, dust lanes through here and, um, and a lot of pretty wild-looking uh, wild structures and a lot of nebula right, right through the center there. Is the Milky Way the white part or the black part? It's the white part. And then there's, there's a lot of dust that's obscuring stars right along there. And then the, 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 I guess the outline stars um, on, on each side of the Milky Way. The um, uh, one thing that happened when I was there where there were uh, a couple of fires, a controlled burn, and then a couple of fires in other places. And it would uh, eventually fill, fill the canyon with this haze and smoke. Uh, this is about 10, 10 p.m. at night, just below the North Rim Lodge. Uh, the moon was actually pretty bright. It was a little bit past the, um, the first quarter, I think. So the, the light from the moon was very bright. Uh, it was lighting up all of the uh, smoke uh, it, within the canyon and then, and then of course abo above the canyon. Uh, but you could see stars up here and you could see a little faint outline of the Milky Way on the left hand side. But you could see uh, the incredible amount of light that the moon uh, th throws out uh, even, even, at a fa even when it's not, the, not a full moon. And this is the uh, eclipse from uh, a, a few, about a month ago, the end of September, we had a total lunar eclipse. Uh, I went out to Mamaroneck where it looked like the weather forecast was slightly better than New York City. And we managed to see pretty much the whole eclipse, a few clouds uh, during totality and in the last part of the phase. But uh, I was working for uh, NHK, the Japanese broadcaster, and they asked if I could do a, a series of still images that they could put together as a uh, time-lapse video. So 
I had, I had a camera set up where I was shooting a picture uh, every minute during the eclipse. So I managed to get uh, roughly 200 pictures during the, during the time, of the, time of the eclipse. And then I put a series of them together in this, uh, in this one still image where uh, each of the partial phases is about um, 10 minutes apart. And then there's one image from the, about the middle of the total phase. Uh, this is the setup uh, that I had, if you're, in, you're interested. It's using a 500 millimeter lens on a, a Nikon D800, or I'm sorry, a D810 camera uh, with a 2X teleconverter. So I had a 1,000 millimeter lens, which, which gave a pretty good size image of the moon uh, in the frame. And I was, uh, had everything mounted on an AstroTrack um, uh, mount, which is uh, uh, a, a mount that you can actually put a telescope on and it, and it tracks the stars. So uh, I needed something that could uh, roughly track the path of the moon across the sky so that uh, I wouldn't have to keep adjusting the, the, the camera on the tripod every few minutes. And uh, the, uh, just a few days ago, I, w I went out, uh, woke up in the morning again to try to get a picture of the planetary, uh, uh, the conjunction going on. And it was too cloudy. And then I turned around in, in the west, and I saw this moon with this unbelievable halo. I was uh, in uh, up a town called Shippensburg, uh, Pennsylvania, which is in south central Pennsylvania. Uh, giving a talk at uh, a few days worth of talks at a university there. So I woke up about 3.30 and it was all, seemed all cloudy. I almost didn't went out, so, but I walked out of the hotel and then I saw this incredible sight of, the, of this halo around the moon. Uh, and, uh, and the halo itself was pretty big. This is uh, with the 14 millimeter lens that I used, so the, uh, the actual size in the, in the sky was pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, when I saw it. And of course, the the moon itself throws out quite a bit of light on the on the landscape. Uh, so, is that as you saw it, or did you assemble this as well? This is the way. This is one frame out of the camera. Because it looks like a really straight horizon. It's a straight horizon because I made it straight in the camera. So, yeah, yeah. There's a. There, I have a level. Uh, there's a. There's a level built into the camera that 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 I could see. But uh, th these are some of the techniques that you you learn. You learn how to. Make, the, make, make a horizon straight. Plus the lens that I use, it's, uh, it's rectilinear, which, which means that there's very little or no distortion with, with straight lines. And so I could, um, you, you, could, you could tilt it up and you could tilt it down and the, the lines themselves will, will, will be straight. Uh, I mean, there might, there might be curvature going, uh, going diagonally, but a, but a horizon will, uh, will be straight uh, across, um, through, through the frame, which is a, Huge help with landscape photography because, uh, in in much of landscape photography, you're seeing the horizon off in the distance. Uh, so that we can take a break of about five minutes uh, uh, now before the second second part. I, I'll, I'll set up for the second part. Um, I have a website that's it's stanhonda.com. I'll, I'll put a stack of cards out here if you're uh, if you want to take a card and you could. I'm also on Instagram and and Facebook if if you want to follow me. 